when did science put its hooks in you? Did you know as a kid that you were oh, yeah. bound for a career? I, I, when I was little, my parents told me that uh, I, I always wanted to be one of two things. One was a garbage man and the other one was a doctor. Hello and welcome to the Bloodstream Podcast. My name is Patrick James Lynch, alongside co-host... Amy Board. And we are very happy to be back with another episode of the Bloodstream Podcast. Today's episode is going to take a look at uh, conversations we had with four expert hematologists during the Bleeding Disorders Conference last week in the Clinician's Corner, part of the Science Fair, the sciencefair.org. Shout out to Spark Therapeutics for making that possible. Amy and I had the pleasure and honor of talking to four expert hematologists for hours and we were able to take all of that well amy primarily and break it down and find some of the most valuable insights and shares from the hours and hours and hours that we spent with these experts to bring them to you here so we're gonna get into that in just a moment but before we do amy there's huge news that came out this morning we're recording this on wednesday the 19th and this morning and i'll, I'll read directly from what i read when i woke up it was a headline from reuters which read USFDA rejects biomarin hemophilia A gene therapy shares dive. So the news did come down today. It's been anticipated now for quite some time that in August the FDA would be giving their response to uh, biomarin's application for approval on their uh, gene therapy product. This morning, the FDA said not quite yet. At the time that we're recording this, I'm sure many organizations have by now posted their statements. I saw the Hemophilia Federation of America's first. I'll read part of that right now. Many patients and their families will be disappointed to learn that gene therapy for hemophilia remains out of reach for the time being. It has been a decades long, dearly held hope that patients could gain access to a single dose treatment that would eliminate bleeding and improve quality of life. Always though, HFA and the overall patient community have also insisted that health and safety remain paramount, especially in view of our community's devastating history with tainted treatments in the 1970s and 80s. With health and safety as our principal touchstones, the patient community relies on the FDA to adhere to its established, quote, gold standard, quote, review, processes, and rigorous science. AHAFA will continue to monitor developments as Biomarin works with the FDA to provide the additional data the FDA has requested. So again, the news is that the FDA has denied Biomarin's application. It is not a slammed door. They need more data. So the process will continue. But Amy, this is big news. Yeah, I think it was, uh, it's shocking news. Um, from what we heard, I mean, it was just resounding that it's like, well, this is going to happen. I mean, we kind of giggled. It was uh, one conversation was like, it's in 18 days. Like, are we going to be prepared in 18 mm -hmm. days? So I, I think everybody feels a little shocked. Um, I feel shocked and it took me a little bit to have it sink in. And in all honesty, um, you know, from my personal chair, I'm not a clinician, I'm not a patient. So take this with a grain of salt. But from my viewpoint, um, I agree. I agree with the decision. I think, um, I think more data is always good. And I also think that the infrastructure hasn't been addressed in terms of where would you go to receive this one treatment? Um, do doctors have to be certified to give this one treatment? You have to be followed for a certain amount of time. Um, that was all kind of elusive in terms of what it would actually be if it was a free for all. So I agree it's so disappointing, but at the same time, I don't think it's a dream that's going away. In fact, I wonder what the momentum will continue to look like as we gather more data and i also wonder this is a question i'm not even sure will the clinical trial still um, be open to folks that want to maybe um mm. get in on the trial is that a thing i i do, um i don't know um as we yeah. often say we're not doctors but um <laughs> i don't think so if my understanding is correct the the ask is really for more long-term data from the existing trial participants. Sure. I don't believe additional trial participants are part of what is being asked for. I don't know if that's a decision that Biomarin and the trial um, 
constructors could decide for other reasons, but I, I, I don't I don't necessarily think so. To the point that you made, Amy, just a few um, a few very well known hematologists, many of whom were part of presentations on novel therapies and gene therapy only a week ago at the BDC. Chiming in, uh, Dr. Robert Sedonio said uh, that he was a bit shocked that they could not have provided this advice, the FDA that is, before, and that they wasted effort, time, and money, a comment that got a lot of um, uh, support on Facebook. Uh, on the other side of things, we talk about Professor Michael Macris in the UK um, here and there on Bloodstream. He had a tweet earlier today. There will always be uncertainties in gene therapy and hemophilia. The key issues for me are the percentage needing steroids in the first six months and durability of response. I do not believe the Biomarin Phase 1-2 study provided data on a large enough number to allow adequately informed decisions. And then going back the other way, we've mentioned his name a couple times, Dr. Guy Young tweeting, um, I'm honestly shocked. Huge setback for hemophilia. Makes no sense. FDA asking for two-year data from phase three study to address durability concerns. The durability question is a five to 10 year question, head scratching emoji. So to, to your point, Amy, I think this is, there's a lot of thoughts, feelings. I've seen patients and families to HFA's statements point, um, posting that they're disappointed in this decision. Um, I was surprised as well this morning to see this. Although I have to say, Amy, I, I hear you on this maybe this is the right decision i'm i don't know i don't know the ins and outs of when the fda could communicate certain things at certain times to not waste time effort and money i'm going to put that to the side for now but based on the conversations we were having last week about all of the big questions around what does it mean for this to be introduced to your point how will clinics be set up to administer it is there enough support in those clinics to administer and follow up with patients because it is a lengthy process in the beginning it's to the point about the first six months in steroids it's the one and done is the long-term vision and truth it is not the short-term experience right. when it is working well so right are we set up for it? Is the insurance and payer system set up and ready to accommodate what it means? They'll tell you we can't do that unless we know about the durability. Is this one right. and done? Because it gets priced differently depending on the value it's adding. Fair. So yes, as we were talking about potentially being like days away from an approval, I did think, frankly, at that time, we were um, talking about a, a pending approval, even though it was not obvi obviously that wasn't going to be the case. But I did think we were moving toward that. And I had some trepidation about all the unknowns that still existed. So I I do appreciate, and HFA made the point about health and safety, and there are a lot of treatments available for the management and treatment of hemophilia. We are unlike 95% of the rare disease population in the United States for whom there is not one FDA approved medication to treat their diseases, not one. We have many within hemophilia. Now, gene therapy is it's like the great white whale or whatever, right? It's the thing out there that we're all striving toward. But until it is where it needs to be to satisfy durability, safety, effectiveness, um, until we have the support system and clinical care necessary to bring patients along this journey, until our healthcare system is set up to accommodate what this brand new classification of drugs is going to mean, until some of these things are addressed, I honestly I don't know that we I don't know that we can have a, a gene therapy that's commercially available in the United States. And if there are patients that are are desperate or are really uh, hungry for it for whatever totally legitimate reasons, there are clinical trials that enroll all around the world for different. Uh, gene therapies, if you're in a very desperate situation, I don't know about compassionate use with gene therapy and how that's mm -hmm. working. Mm -hmm. In theory, there are options for you, but I guess I do skew on the side of being a bit conservative. So my instinct is, yeah, there were a lot of questions yeah. that were up there. So if the FDA feels like we need more time, I, I don't, I can't really disagree with that from my patient non hematological or expert point of view. Yeah, I agree. And and for patient families and for consumers, you know, having more data to have underneath your belt, you know, going into some of these massive decisions. And I mean, I think that's the thing massive. that I I came away with from the BDC is for the first time in hemophilia, I mean, truly there is a paradigm shift in treatment. And so the expertise needed for the prescriber is going 
to increase. Um, it's going to become more nuanced. And this FDA rejection does not mean that it it's not quote unquote working. There's just so many nuanced right. science. So it's not like it's dead in the water at all. It's just there's more data. There's more um, there just needs to be more information. And I think it's still an encouraging time, to tell you the truth. In fact, I think it's a it's a I massively agree. encouraging time. I, I think if it was approved today, in my humble opinion, I would put on my seatbelt and be like, giddy up, let's go. Like who yep, knows wh- like it's the wild wild I'd west. I'd be celebrating. I'd be celebrating. I would I Totes. would I would I would op- like you, I would acknowledge there's a lot we don't know. These questions are still unanswered. That doesn't change because there was a different outcome. Right. We would just buckle up for it. But given that this is the reality, I do I do breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief in a way. Right. And I'm glad that we can kind of tiptoe a bit closer before before we run. And I will say, you know, leading into um, some of the clips that we're going to play you today, um, we have in our grasp, in my opinion, are very accessible. Um, Some physicians and top minds that are truly positioned to help disseminate all of this stuff that's happening. Um, I think the conversations we had during our Clinician's Corner at the Science Fair during BDC were so enlightening. Everybody kind of comes from a different angle. Um, NHF CEO is a physician. He has been in the gene therapy field now, my goodness, for a decade. Um, We are well positioned to, like as a community, to continue growing in in our knowledge and expertise going into that room where we make the decision of what we want to do with our treatment going forward. And that's so encouraging to me. And mm-hmm. um, so I, I, I want to acknowledge the disappointment. I think the disappointment is real, but yes, I also it is. It is. want to um, still, you know, I don't know, kind of, um, there's still hope there's still hope and there's still encouragement because uh, it's it's not halted. Nothing's halted. You mentioned it earlier. Durability was the big uh, 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 issue in question. How long will this maintain in the body? But we're, uh, from my opinion, if you're talking about, hey, you might have to take a shot every two to four to five years uh, where we are right now, I mean, that's a huge step forward. So it comes back to expectations. It comes back to what is the need being met and is what is being provided and the data uh, supportive of that need. And the FDA says not yet, but this is a hopeful time. This is a very hopeful time. I agree with you on that. And I, I guess I just want to implore listeners, if you have some thoughts or even emotions you want to share about this to like reach out to Patrick and I, we're really we're really accessible on social media and and through email. I I person I know Patrick would. I know Patrick gets this regularly. Um, to just share, we would love to kind of hear what the community beat heartbeat is about this stuff because it's big. This is a big big news. Absolutely, and if it's not something you want to be shared on air, like you can just yeah oh yeah, yeah. Know, just send us a message and talk to us as people, and then if it's something that we can talk about, we'll ask you. But. You know, this is a community podcast. This is why we're here. This is yep. part of the idea of Bloodstream, that when moments like this happen, there's somewhere to go to kind of process, hear from some experts, get involved in a conversation, especially in a year like this, where we don't have the ability to do that yep. in person. So with that, Amy, I think we should start moving into the first segment. Sounds great. This is, I'm so excited for you guys to hear these conversations. <laughs> so uh, they were a <laughs> highlight for me. They, and me as well. Yeah, Amy and I, every time we kind of walk in there, it's like, wow, this is like some dense stuff. With I mean, we, we had an hour with each one of these brilliant minds to just grill them in the way that we wanted to. So and we would be we would fun. be talking to these guys and we'd be texting each other like, that was incredible. Oh, that was amazing. That was amazing. Did I understand that right? It was like real, <laughs> real nerdy stuff. Real, real nerdy stuff. But it, it was a highlight for me too. So um, yeah, so here first is Dr. Valentino talking about this idea of are we prepared for new therapies. Let's take a listen. From a, a broad perspective, Len, we had the science fair last year, and now a year later at the science fair again this year at the virtual BDC. What's maybe prioritized in thinking about non-factor therapies, gene therapy, future of therapy, and the models to support it, the treatment <clears throat> and management concerns, the sustainability of the models? H- have any of those bumped up significantly in prioritization for you since we were here together a year ago? I would say that um, 
re- still at the top of the the list is safety. We have to ensure that we have safe medications, whether that's um, you know factor replacement therapies or non-factor treatments or a gene therapy or you know some other cellular therapy. I, I think that we have to demonstrate clear safety of these. Now, obviously, we're not going to have the long-term safety data that we're going to we would want going into this. But I think we have to have some reasonable reassurance of the safety of these products that we, I, I just, I, we cannot have um, sort of the, the, the age of enlightenment and enthusiasm that followed factor concentrates and then sort of the bursting of the balloon with HIV. And you, you, we cannot have that type of you know, situation recur because we're not being thoughtful enough and, and really uh, looking carefully at these, these different treatment modalities. Um, I think we've, we hopefully have learned our lesson once, um, but you know, sometimes uh, uh, you know, memory gets short and I think we really have to be careful. So safety for me, you know, so the safety summit was something that I antici- anticipate continuing I think that's something that we probably need at least once a year. Um, it may be something that we need to do more frequently as well. Um, and maybe some, uh, you know, a national safety summit and then potentially some regional uh, smaller safety summits if we can ever get back to working, you know, face to face. So safety, I think, is, is, is paramount. The, you know, and obviously then we have to have products that are effective and are, um, that are cost effective as well. And, you know, I think we can come up with lots of treatments that are effective, but they really have to provide incremental benefit over what we currently do. Um, and, you know, I think Heme Libra has demonstrated that to a great degree where, you know, in the inhibitor population, there's, it's, it's, un- it's unquestionable that the incremental benefit is tremendous. Yeah. Um, in the non-inhibitor population, I think we need more data. You know, I still think, uh, um, you know, we're, we're, we have an anecdotal experience of 6,000 people, but we don't have, you know, the, the, the data collection in those people in terms of, you know, sort of these, um, the, the immediate effects, I think, are clear in terms of the cessation of bleeding and the resolution of target joints um, and actually improvement in joint function. Because probably, you know, you're not bleeding, you don't have as much inflammation, and you're able to do some physiotherapy and have more activities. But are there the same long-term benefits to joints and muscles, the musculoskeletal system, that we recognized and appreciated with factor replacement therapy? So we do need to have those long-term studies, you know. And if it's the, you know, the joint outcome study that's done for non-factor therapies, then, you know, that's what we need. Um, but we need safe, you know, safe, but also effective medications that are demonstrated to be safe for the important outcomes that you want. You know, it's not what I want, you know, as a clinician, it's what you want as a patient. And I think that's where we really need to start focusing our efforts is, you know, these, these patient important outcomes. You know, I don't like the term patient reported outcomes. Um, I really like the- Why is that? Well, I mean, I think patient reported is important, but I could ask you to report something that's irrelevant to you. I want something that you're going to report mm-hmm. that's relevant and important in your life. So that that's where I think it's the patient important outcomes or patient mm-hmm. relevant outcomes that are so important um, that we need to be focusing on, especially as we get to um, moving you know, the, the community from acute management, which was really in the 70s, you know, so you, you know, that, that was, that was the, the age of, you know, people having to go to the hospital to get infused and having to go to a clinic to get infused. Now, you know, we're, we're sort of in this chronic disease management state where people are, in, you know, managing their disease at home and it's a chronic disease more than anything else. But as we move forward, it's not even a chronic disease. We're looking at, you know, the opportunities for cure. 
um, you know, it may not be here today, it may not be tomorrow, but it's going to be, you know, it, it's soon that we're going to be knocking on the cure doorstep. And um, then it becomes what are the outcomes that are relevant to people in that state as opposed to um, the, the a control of bleeding. You know, it's more lifestyle. How do we empower people who have inherited bleeding disorders to feel fully empowered to live their life um, to the way they choose and not be encumbered by a bleeding disorder? Given, you know, you mentioned maybe not today, not tomorrow, but the cure is the goal and that that is what is at the end of the tunnel. Um, but very soon we may have gene therapeutics available for patients. Um, to your point about safety as a top concern um, and considering that we're living through a pandemic as well do you think do you have any concerns about that reality whether it's it's sooner or later right it's coming very soon one way or another um, are we well set up for it I don't know if we're as a community we're prepared again for one-time therapies um, I don't think we're we as not a hemophilia or a bleeding disorders community, but as a, as a community at large, we're not ready for. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're already being challenged with um, Vilgesma for spinal muscular atrophy, you know, and, and, and certainly um, as other one-time therapies come out, we, we definitely need to figure out the, the reimbursement strategy. So in that respect, no, we're not. And I think from a, a medical perspective, um, we might be, but I think there's still a huge um, education gap that exists among clinicians about these these therapies and really feeling comfortable and empowering clinicians to have the conversation with patients. You know, it's all about a shared decision-making process. And um, I'm not sure that clinicians feel fully comfortable um, having this conversation. I mean, I'll tell you that you know, being immersed in gene therapy for two and a half years, I'm not sure that I'm fully comfortable having that conversation with a patient. And that's all I did for two and a half years. Mm. Um, and thinking about the strategy of how you educate patients and educate clinicians, um, I think it's a tall order. It's, it, this is not something we learned in medical school or nursing school. Um, so it's, it's a completely different mindset. Um, you know, we're looking at things like, uh, can we develop a gene therapy academy where we can, you know, provide some immersive training for people around gene therapy and advanced technologies? Um, you know, so, so I think in that respect, we're probably not ready. And, I, and I, one of the main reasons that I thought me coming to NHF would be a good thing is I also think that the patient community is not prepared. And this was an opportunity for me to, to share and to really work more closely with the patient community to prepare patients and families for one-time therapies. And again, whether that's gene therapy or a cellular therapy, um, I think we've got a long way to go. And you know, my fear is that patients will see a gene therapy as the shiny ball in front of them and grasp for it and really not understand all of the implications just because it's you know new and shiny and I'm gonna take it. Um, it really has to be done in a thoughtful and careful way because we don't understand all the risks that are associated with these new therapies. And what you mentioned the, the um, knowledge gap amongst clinicians, not your exact words, but that there was a, mm -hmm. something to that effect. Um, how, how does that get addressed? The community piece is, is kind of a separate piece, but I'm curious, what, what are some of the tactics being used to help address that piece of the education burden? Well, I think each of the developers of novel therapies are experts in their own molecule, technology, whatever it is. So th there, there's, there's some expertise that we can garner from the people who are developing them. They're, you know, they're the experts. However, you know, having participated and been in, you know, uh, I guess four different companies, um, you know, in, in over seven years, there's always some skepticism regarding information and educational materials that might come from a company. So I really see that the future is that we need to develop ways to partner with the experts. 
So I see NHF again is in, in a, a extremely well positioned um, to be able to do this where, um, you know, we can take an unbiased approach but we can partner with the experts. So we can partner with, you know, drug developer number three and utilize their experts to, to impart that wisdom and that knowledge that they've got to, uh, for example, a writing group. And then maybe it's a series of monographs that are developed on individual molecules that are developed, you know, with a, um, with a level of transparency and a level of, um, uh, openness that we communicate, uh, you know, f freely and openly. You know, I, I know that companies are often constrained by what they can and can't say because of compliance and legal issues and frankly, marketing issues as well. Um, but I think being able to, to collect that information from a company and then using, you know, an unbiased, um, uh, external writing group, for example, to create a series of monographs about each individual molecule is one of the things that I thought really strongly about that I'd like to undertake, you know, on behalf of NHF, put together groups of experts that can do this. Um, so I think that's one way. Another thing that we're looking to do is to have a, um, uh, uh, a new conference on gene, cellular, and novel therapies purely an educational conference. And the target of the, the, this type of conference would be the healthcare professionals. But of course it would be open to patients and it would be open to policymakers. And you know, the, the broad community could attend, but really the presentations would be geared towards um, healthcare professionals and the, with a goal of increasing their level of knowledge around these novel therapies. And you can see that there could be multiple different um, approaches taken. There could be some of the science, you know, the, the, what went into developing these molecules, the clinical trials, but then also discussions and presentations around reimbursement, um, around the policies that are, are uh, you know, part of all of this. So I, I think that that type of a conference is, is we're ready for that. Um, and we're ready to do it from, you know, an unbiased way so that it's not a company, a for-profit company that's doing this but it's you know, NHF uh, on behalf of the inherited bleeding disorders community. But it could even be broader than that. It could be um, on behalf of the rare blood disorders community as well. Because I think the, the same things that we're dealing with with hemophilia um, and, and blood dis or bleeding disorders are gonna be true for von Willebrand disease and, and uh, thalassemia and sickle cell disease. Um, as well. So I, I think it's a more around blood diseases um, that we need that education. And frankly, you know, the, the, the target audience, the hematologists, we care for all of these diseases. So it, it, I think there's a lot of economy of scale there by talking about those diseases. Hey, Patrick here. Quick interruption with a reminder that the Bloodstream podcast, this episode and every episode, it's made possible by Takeda. And if you want to learn more about Takeda and their commitment to the bleeding disorders community, there's a really, really complicated website I got to send you to, bleedingdisorders.com. Did you get that? It is bleedingdisorders.com to learn more about Takeda and their commitment to our community. And as always, for your support of the Bloodstream podcast, we say thanks, Takeda. I loved that conversation with Dr. Valentino and mm. Patrick. I know you and I discussed this, um, but just to reiterate that NHF truly is positioned to um, lead some of these uh, discussions on safety, on some of the questions, um, the infrastructure. Um, they, re they, they truly are positioned well to um, help us in this time as we go into the unknown, man. <laughs> Yeah, they are. And I think they've never been more receptive to the patient voice guiding how we get there. So if you are interested in contributing to that part or any part of NHF's work, this year is the year to reach out and get involved. So changing gears a little bit, um, next we're going to hear from Dr. Guy Young. Before gene therapy was the thing on the horizon, this thing called emicizumab was. And now it has been around for a couple few years. And some of the questions that there were when that was first approved have since been answered, or at least have started to get answered. Dr. Young will talk more about that right now. 
I think the, the challenging area is with those new parents of very young babies. I've had several of these in the last few months. Um, how do you, you know, in the past, it, the discussion was easy. There is no treatment we can give your very, very young baby right now. And we'll just wait it out. And when they get older and they start to bleed, nine months, one year, year and a half, you know, then, you know, when they have a joint bleed or even if they don't, we can start talking about prophylaxis. And the reason is that intravenous therapy, you know, one week old, two week old, three month old is, is, is really essentially almost impossible. I mean, you'd have to put in a central venous catheter, not a port because they're too small, a central venous catheter that sticks out through the skin, something called a Broviac or Hickman catheter. Those things are notoriously risky for getting infected. How do you wash your baby? I mean, we, we, you know, we didn't do that before and we don't do it now because of the, all those risks. But here comes a drug that can be given subcutaneously. And, and, you know, and, and for all the way people might feel about uh, you know, emicizumab, the reality is it, 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 it is given subcutaneously. So therefore, we can, we have an option now to start treatment literally like right out of the womb, right? Right out of the uterus after delivery. We have that option because we, because to give a subcutaneous medication to a baby that young is really not a problem. Yeah, it's a needle. It hurts a little. They cry. But I mean, it's, it's it logistically actually quite simple. And, and, you know, for really sick babies in the neonatal intensive care unit, they get subcutaneous injections all the time. So, so the question with emicizumab is we can give it at a very, very, very young age. Really, the question is, should we? And if we want to, what would be the reason? And since there's no data on babies that young, at least as of yet, how do we know it'll work? And do we have to monitor it? And what are the risks? And, and so, you know, it, it, it sort of opens a Pandora's box of questions by having this option. And so, yes, the discussion with the parents of newborns is very different now than it was, you know, two years ago, because we have to include that as an option. And I discussed that actually in great detail in the talk I gave at ISTH. Um, and I was actually asked to write a review article uh, based on that talk, which, I, which I'm going to start working on soon. But really, the whole issue revolves around intracranial hemorrhage. So bleeding in the brain in hemophilia, in general, is not common. It occurs about 5%, 6% of the time. But when it does occur, most of those, the vast majority, 90% of those, occur before nine months of age. So... Again, in that's the past, super interesting. I did yeah, not know that. That's yeah, very that, interesting. That's, yeah, that that's been demonstrated in in multiple you know um, sort of natural history studies. So in the past, you know, we just we we had to kind of throw our hands up. There's not much we couldn't do anything. We just ex I would explain to the parents, look, this can happen. Here are the symptoms, and if you feel like your child's having those symptoms, you know, call us or come to the emergency room right away. And yeah, it happens every year. I have at least one. I just had one a few weeks ago. Every year I have at least one baby that, that has that situation. Um, now, with Hem, now before Hemlibra, there was no, right, we couldn't really do anything. We just say, well, let's keep our fingers crossed. If it happens, we'll treat it right away and we'll deal with it. But, but now there's an opportunity to give a medication that presumably should be effective at, at improving the coagulation status of that baby and, there, and therefore, in theory, and I stress in theory, should be effective to prevent intracranial hemorrhage. Now, we talked about, you know, can we do a study? The answer is really no, uh, because the number of patients you'd need to prove that that would be effective in a very young cohort of pups would be prohibitive. I think most of us agree that it's probably something that'll never really be able to be truly studied. The only way we could is eventually, you know, is with cohort studies, eventually you know, we'll get all these pups on these studies and some of them will have started hemlibra at a you know, one month of age, let's say, and others maybe didn't for whatever reason. And then even though it's, it's not a great way to do a, a study, that, that's probably the only way we'll have to get some answers. So yeah, so that, that's the long answer. Uh, but in a nutshell, yeah, that's basically the, the situation um, as to how we have to have a totally different discussion now with parents. And yeah, so as a result of that, I have a, I had one family at five weeks of age. Based on this discussion, we started Hemlibra. And another baby had an intra, who actually already had an intracranial hemorrhage right after birth, um, who started Hemlibra at one week of age. Um, we did Facker for a week, and then we're like, well, what are we going to do? Keep this baby in the hospital till he's like three months old? And 
you know, that there's obviously issues with that. So we kind of bit the bullet and said, we'll, we'll stop the factor at one week thinking, okay, we got enough factor in there to stop the bleeding and then, and then rely on Hemlibra at that point. So yeah, there, there's really different discussions to be had because of that. And as someone who has done a lot of research into inhibitors as well, um, there's discussion about if you're using Hemlibra, you haven't tolerized, if there's an inhibitor, it hasn't necessarily been tolerized. Is it problematic then? If you start Hemlibra before X number of exposure days, are we then uncertain about the prevalence of an inhibitor? Could it then reap its head at a, an unfortunate point? You probably have about as much knowledge and perspective on this as anybody. So I would just love to hear you speak to that. Yeah. I mean, uh, yes. Yeah, so so <laughs> there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? Um, so that isn't it. So I discussed that in my talk. Um, you know, the before Hem Libra, right, the natural history of inhibitors was you'd start prophylaxis, you know, when you're a baby, I don't know, a year old, let's say, nine months, a year, 15 months. And we know that inhibitors pretty much are going to happen in the first 50 exposure days, virtually 100%. Well, if you're on prophylaxis at twice a week or three times a week, it doesn't take a long time. I mean, within four months, six months, you hit the 50 exposure days. So before you're even two years old, we know you have an inhibitor or you don't. If you don't, you'll probably never get one. If you do, then we'll deal with it. The issue with starting Hemlibra before you hit 50 exposure days, certainly, I mean, most of, the, most of the inhibitors come by 20 exposure days, about 95%. Certainly before 20 exposure days is what are you going to do about the factor eight? And so there are really a few ways to go about that that I had presented. One was you could just say, you know, the hell with it. Hemlibra works. If my son gets an inhibitor, actually one mom even said, ah, if he gets an inhibitor, what's the difference? Just stays on him Libra, right? I'm like, yeah, I, I guess so. I never thought about if you get an inhibitor, what's the difference? You never really, because inhibitors are problematic, right? Now, I don't necessarily, I don't agree with, with that. I mean, it, there is a problem if you get an inhibitor. I, I don't want anybody to walk away from this discussion thinking getting an inhibitor these days is no big deal. It is still a big deal. Um, but one option is to say, I'm not going to add any factor eight. And then, you know, if and when an inhibitor comes, we'll deal with it. Now, the thing is, the, the time it would take to get to 20 exposure days based on how effective Hemlibra is. So I think Robert Sedonia, it's somebody in his team, they, they just did a little bit of math based, you know, they did a mathematical model based on the data. And I think they estimated that on average, it would take 13 years until you get to 20 exposure days which means that the whole thing about getting an inhibitor, instead of knowing by the time you're two, for the, for the most part, you're gonna have to wait this thing out for 10, 12, 15 or more years. And the problem there is that the inhibitor could happen to show up at a really bad time, right? A teenager was, I don't know, playing sports, he kind of fell, hit his head, got an injury, uh, got taken to the hospital, is gonna get some factor, needs some surgery, and now the inhibitor is rearing up and you're giving factor eight and this kid is bleeding and the surgery's not going well. I mean, that, you know, there, there's a potential nightmare scenario there. Uh, now with a hematologist, yeah, you quickly be like, oh yeah, maybe there's an inhibitor and we could adjust, but there's gonna be an, a problem. So the other two options are one is to go ahead and start the Hemlibra, but at some point when it's reasonable with a port or without a port to add factor eight. And you can add factor eight, you know, twice a week, once a week, three times a week. Dr. Sidonia is actually doing a study where they're doing it every other week. The problem with every other week is then it takes two years to get to 50 exposure days. So you're kind of going at it for a while. I think once a week makes sense. You probably don't need a port. Once a week, by a year, you're at 50 exposure days and you know whether you have an inhibitor or not. So that's one other path to go. And then the other path, which a patient of mine actually took after a long discussion, was basically they said, you know what, Dr. We, we, we want to know if he's going to have an inhibitor or not. So um, now he happened to be nine months old at the time. He said, let's start prophylaxis. So we went prophylaxis, no port. Um, he happened to be on an extended half-life product twice a week. And we did it for about five months. He got to like 45, 46 exposure days. And then his veins were completely shot. We couldn't even get another dose in. But, you know, he got to 45. So the chances of getting an inhibitor now is pretty close to zero. And they said, okay, now we know he, he didn't get an inhibitor. Now we know he doesn't have an inhibitor. Now we're going to go to emicizumab. So that family, at least they know, they don't have to worry about an inhibitor in their child. And now they can just go with emicizumab without that concern if you don't do it. So, you know, all of these things are, are real life scenarios for which we don't have data, for which we don't really have experience even. 
And we're kind of figuring out as we go, there are some studies that are going to try to deal with some of that, but not everything is going to be able to be answered with a study. That was an important conversation with Dr. Young and such a um, specific conversation with such an expert um, in infancy and um, managing and treating hemophilia um, for infants. And so I know those decisions for families are very difficult. And I appreciated um, Dr. Young really going into the very specific and personalized um, yes. avenues of treatments that we have now, in particular um, with infants, first exposures, how many exposures to clotting factor, and of course the, you know, the new and very you know changing, um, innovative you know stuff that we have with emesivizumab. So I I, I mm. loved that um, that piece with Dr. Young. Likewise, yeah, and a good reminder too for anyone who did attend uh, the BDC, who is a registered member of the Bleeding Disorders Conference. Dr. Young was involved in numerous sessions on uh, novel therapies, on gene therapy, speaking about emesizumab. So if you do want to hear more from him and you registered for the conference, those sessions will be available until the end of the month. So you can check those out via hemophilia.org. So following emesizumab, we are in this state now of anticipating gene therapy, as we've talked about plenty. And Dr. Kwan spoke with us about gene therapy, not so much the anticipation of it as what exactly is it that we're talking about when we say gene therapy? And here's Dr. Kwan to answer that. Currently, gene therapy in hemophilia is looking at a transfer. So you're you're trying to get the a correct working, I shouldn't say correct, but a working factor eight or factor nine gene back into the body and get it to make the protein that is missing or dysfunctional. So whatever gene that you pick and lots of thought has gone into the correct gene to use for factor eight and factor nine, um, you try to get that into the body and Currently, we're using vectors, and we call those viral vectors. So a virus that has been modified, and I know everybody's scared right now because the coronavirus can cause all kinds of disease, right? Yeah. So they've done a lot of investigation, and they've identified viruses that do not cause significant disease in humans, and they have taken those, and literally, like we know all of the sequence, like we can sequence DNA, right? We could, we took those sequences and took out all the ones that could cause any problems and just made, made a shell of that virus. And so we now have this viral particle that's just a shell. And then you put in the gene of interest that you're trying to correct or fix and then put that into the body. And so you hope that that will go to, and you can target it. And in this case, we're targeting the liver because clotting factors are made in the liver. So that was the, the short version of a gene therapy. Oh, that <laughs> and, and that's how they're doing it. So in different, in different disease states, they may be doing it differently. So sickle cell may be doing a different type of gene therapy, and it's also a genetic disorder. Mm -hmm. So it might be doing a different type of gene therapy than hemophilia, than uh, that muscular dystrophy, uh, like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy may be doing it slightly differently. Right. I, I'm not an expert in that area, so I, I can never address Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which is very common, or mm -hmm. not common, but a, you know, an, a genetic disorder that can affect people. And, and Dr. Kwan, as you were saying, the, the, the viral vector goes to the liver because that's where the proteins will be produced from. Mm -hmm. But what then happens once the viral vector reaches the liver? Does, does the whole thing stay there? Does that viral shell stay in the liver? What, what actually happens Good to the question. whole package? Yeah. So your package gets delivered and like, when you, I like Dr. Pipe's sort of delivery system where it's an Amazon box, right? So the viral shell is akin to the, the box. And once you get your package, you open it. And so that DNA then 
the virus gets into the shell with the uh, package, the gene inside gets into the cell and then it has to get into the nucleus, which is sort of where all your DNA is. And then it delivers that, our DNA of interest into the nucleus, but you have all of your DNA, which is in chromosomes, and then you have this little extra piece of DNA that has your gene of interest, and in our case, either factor eight or factor nine, and it just sits outside of your own DNA. So the package gets delivered into the nucleus, so it gets targeted to the nucleus, and then it goes into the nucleus and sits there. So your DNA isn't affected, and the outside DNA that you added just sits there and gets made. That's what we're hoping to take advantage of the machinery that's already inside the nucleus to get that protein made. And you, you were talking before about gene editing, in, which is in preclinical trials. And I'm guessing that th at that point in the process, there's a big difference between um, sitting outside and with gene editing actually going in and changing structurally yes. the DNA. So it would have to, it'd have to go. So it would have to do all of those steps that we talked about get through your body. So it's given to you IV, right? That single infusion is what they talk about for gene therapy for, for these kind of methods. So you get inside your body, finally go to your target, get inside the cell, and then go into the nucleus. So gene editing would have to do the same thing. But the mechanism would be different. Instead of having the gene factor eight or factor nine sit outside your DNA, the, the things that it would start editing the, your own DNA. So it would somehow find your factor eight or factor nine gene and sort of it, and I've heard this cut and paste kind of a mechanism, right? Where you would find your factor eight or factor nine gene, sort of cut out what's missing and replace with what's functional. That, and that's super interesting. I feel like we could spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, but given that it sounds like we're still a ways away from that being something that unless someone's involved in a clinical trial will really be widely available. Is that accurate? Yes. yes. And I believe they've done it in animals and they can, I mean, but it's different in animals, right? You can control the environment and everything. Whereas here it's a little harder to control everything that's going on. What is it that you um, are and will be looking for in the very near future when gene transfer, gene therapy is made available, whenever that may be. Um, what is it that you will be looking for, curious about keeping an eye on as patients make the choice to use it and our, our reporting experiences, kind of that follow on data, what, what will you be looking for? So if you, I, I, first of all, I, I mean, the, the big goal of course is to make factor eight, right? Or factor nine. And uh, the patients are followed for so many things, <laughs> you know. So let's say you join Patrick or your brother or whoever joins a trial, right? So at the beginning of a trial, in the, in especially in these gene therapies, you're there almost every week for labs. You've you literally a pin cushion, I call it, because you're constantly getting labs. So sure. if you have an aversion to having labs drawn, this is not something that you want to do. <laughs> Which is not an insignificant <laughs> point. No, it's, yeah. come on, you're doing it every week for, in yeah. some studies, it's only 12 weeks, and then it moves to every month for another, you know, full year. So even then, it's still a lot of blood draws. For some studies, it's much longer, 40 plus weeks, right? So you get labs drawn every week and we follow so many different things. Um, you follow the factor levels, of course. Uh, we are very interested. In, remember I said it was targeting the liver? Well, yes. the liver can get up, can give, can tell, tell you if it's inflamed or angry, so to speak. And it'll, it'll leak out these enzymes and we check for those enzymes every week and sometimes even more if we find that they're starting to be, so we get your baseline, we know what your baseline should be. And if it starts to go up, even if, if it's in the normal limits, 
because the, the normal can go from, for example, 15 to 40, right? That's a big range. That's a big range, yeah. Right. And if you're starting out at 22 and it goes up to 40, it's still within the normal range, that 40, but it's higher than your baseline of 22. So is something going on? And so we're monitoring it, not just flagging an abnormal lab, but actually have to look at every lab and say, it's different from your baseline. And so we'll have to look at it much more closely and decide whether or not your liver is inflamed and start medication for that. Dr. Cohen, we have a, um, a question from one of our attendees. What percentage of the community do you think will latch on to the gene therapy treatment as a treatment option when it comes out? That's a good question. I, I don't know if I can answer that because you have to be eligible or qualify. And mm -hmm. one of those qualifications is you have to get tested to see if you've had immunity to that particular virus. So have you been exposed to that virus? If you have been exposed and you will have immunity, and I mean, people might understand this in light of coronavirus right now, right? That they say, we talk about antibodies and how, how you measure it and things like that. So we can measure your antibodies and see if you've been exposed to it. If you've been exposed to it, then you, you may have immunity, meaning that if we give you that viral shell containing the gene, it'll sense it as, oh my God, this is a virus and I'm going to get rid of you. And so the antibodies will come and attack that virus and it won't be as effective. Is it invasive to find that out is it no, something it's that, just a blood draw it's, it's just, just a blood, blood draw, draw. Mm -hmm. and is there anything that we know about the prevalence of that immunity amongst yeah. our community so or what leads to it yeah so there have been studies done and the different viruses so mostly we have been using for hemophilia studies adeno associated virus there are different types of viruses um, so adeno-associated virus or AAV. So you might hear everybody saying AAV vector. So it's called, it stands for adeno-associated virus. And that, that one prevalence depending on where you are, like geographically, but a, a number might be around 25%. Wow. So, okay. So, so it's a significant number. Yes. And so not everybody will be, uh, quote, eligible for that. So we have to check. Is it is it worth, and I guess there's insurance questions in this too, but it feels <laughs> to me like, uh, right, but like, it feels to me like it would be worth screening for that, like sooner than not, whether or not you're thinking about gene therapy in six months or six years, just the psychological knowledge that, that it's an option for me or not feels kind of important. Well, the problem is that if I test today, right, I'm, I'm negative, but if I test a year from now, will I have been exposed to it? Sure. And then will I be positive? So oh. it, it might give you an idea now to do it, but then we still have to retest. And so patients that I actually enrolled into a beginning part of that trial were eligible, but disappointment because six months later when we retested them they became positive so they may have had like i said it doesn't cause a huge disease maybe you had a runny nose for one day and thought oh it's allergies and let it go and it could have been that virus that caused you to have such a minor thing that you just didn't think anything about it hmm. so i have had somebody negative and then turn positive I've actually had two different patients in two different trials have that happen. They were negative and they turned positive. Yeah, because they got exposed. Yeah, yeah. Again, it's just so, again, we, you have to choose something that's not gonna cause any major issue in, in your body, in, in humans. And so they must have gotten it in passing somehow. And well, I know they, neither of them claimed, well, one of them, this was early on, one of them said that their father was sick, but they weren't sick. So maybe he did get exposed to it. Yeah. He was asymptomatic. Were, were they 
were they pretty bummed when yes. they found out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to put it mildly. Yeah. Well, how do you navigate that part? Uh, that's a lot. I mean, just like any, any other bad news, you, you have to talk them through it. Um, and alternatives, you know, you, you continue your normal treatment until something else comes around. And, and as I said, the technology is always advancing and people are working on gene therapies that are non viral based, like mm -hmm. other ways to get them into your body that is not based on a virus vector. There are other things that are going on that you can get it in. Um, nat particle, some other type of nanoparticles or things like that. I'm not really familiar with it, but there are other people working. Mm -hmm. Apparently, right now, I guess that type of technology is, is in its infancy in, for disease, con genetic disorders kind of thing. Dr. Kwan is uh, excellent, and I'm happy to say my hematologist because I very much enjoy listening to her speak about that which she is expert in. In fact, I did it yesterday at my annual clinic visit. But one <laughs> thing that I think comes through in what she was talking about there, especially at the end, was uh, expectations related to the gene therapy, gene transfer process. Expectations um, such as not everyone with hemophilia is going to be uh, hemophilia A is going to qualify for this. You may have immunity to the virus being used as the vector to bring the gene into your body, and you might test that you are um, that you're good to go. You have no immunity to that. Right, sign up for the trial, go through the process. You show up for day one, and I'm sorry, you have since been exposed to that virus. You have developed antibodies. You are no longer qualified, and that that will happen. That will happen to certain people in this process at some point. And it's very important that we're prepared for what this, what adopting this new treatment class will look like as a community and for us as individuals, what all the potential outcomes for us could be. It's very important that we appreciate those details so that we don't set ourselves up for massive disappointment, frustration. That's just a whole, that's a whole catastrophic, uh, what do they call it? The, uh, I'm doing a gesture that only Amy can see. What is this gesture, Amy? <laughs> like a spiral? Circling the drain, spiral, downward spiral. spiral. That's yeah, what right, I'm looking there for. You go, there you go. Spinning my finger around like, oh, it's a basketball. <laughs> is this how you do it? Maybe this is how you do it. Um, but anyway, Dr. Kwan, thank you as always. And thank you for being an excellent uh, hematologist for me. And, and actually, what a shift that treatment for hemophilia is not going to be black and white anymore. Yeah. And the emotional and just like you said the emotional expectations because that's the reality there's going to be so much disappointment and anger and it's just not the reality so mm -hmm. becoming comfortable within the uncomfortable is going to be a very tricky emotional place but but uh it's why we need community it's why we got to keep yes supporting each other showing up to events staying engaged sharing experiences because this is things are going to get more complex not less complex we may be getting healthier and having better quality of lives as a community as we progress here but not for a lack of complexity so right. we got to stay connected we got to stay informed uh amy why don't you tee us up for this last segment since um you and dr mike have uh a, a lovely history Oh my gosh, Dr. Mike. So our next physician is Dr. Michael Wong. He is the clinical director at the University of Colorado, HTC. He is my mentor. And just as a personal note, it was my favorite part of the conference to have Patrick get to like have a conversation with Dr. Mike. I have had I countless. felt so bad. I thought I was, like, <laughs> I felt I was monopolizing that terribly oh my gosh it like made my day i have had countless you know dr mike used to like we would go out to lunch and just talk about things and he is so aware uh, of this human emotional expectation he has a humanistic side yes. to him as yes, well really as does. a clinical scientific side to him he is a diamond in the rough and he explains things so well and he sees things from a business point of view in terms of reimbursement and just the overall systemic issues of healthcare that have really inspired me in my in my path so it was it was a joy and I'm so looking forward to you all getting to hear Dr. Mike a little bit um, we we kind of chose this clip he he really um, goes into the outlook of all these new novel therapies and at the end he kind of speaks to his experience of what he's witnessed from some of his patients on gene therapy clinical trials that was it, it was it was very special so we're excited for you guys to hear more from Dr. Mike 
is there is there anything in the in the other um in the non-factor investigational category that kind of gets overshadowed and and there's also factor that's being investigated too that right. over gets gets overshadowed by the gene therapy is there anything from those buckets that are of particular interest to you safety i mean i i think the the concizumab and the fetuzuran um trials are going to allow us to understand coagulation very deeply right so why that because because there's a huge amount of concern that you cannot rebalance the coagulation system by, 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 by. it's like, uh, you can't make two wrongs into a right. Okay. Um, and so that, that, um, that you, you were probably exposing the patient to some, some tremendous risk. David Lillycraft spoke about this a couple of years ago. He put up this great slide about the evolution of the coagulation system. And coagulation proteins haven't changed in millions of years. <laughs> and, um, and he's like, you know, there probably is a reason why our coagulation system, as imperfect as it is, is the way it is. And it's been this huh. way for a long, long, long time. That's interesting. Any perturbation in it causes a problem. And so that's the counter argument for re all the rebalancing therapies. Um, you know, um, I think the Unicure factor eight gene therapy thing is fascinating, right? They're going to make an emicizumab like molecule, right? To, to, I think, I believe that's what they're proposing to, uh, basically instead of making sub Q emicizumab, you, you're going to just make it yourself. Um, and, uh, that's fascinating, but you know, I don't know. I mean, are there any concerns in the way that there's still concerns about non tolerized inhibitors, if you're treating with hem Libra or emesizumab, but you still have the underlying inhibitor that, that, that could complicate matters and treating bleeds. Does mm -hmm. that, does that concern exist with a concizumab as well? So yeah. It doesn't solve for that piece of it. It's just a, a, a greater expression in a way of the molecules abilities right you're right so you know the the data point that makes everybody really nervous about the rebalancing therapies and it, and it could be false is that the the one thing that we follow in patients who have blood clots is a is a molecule called a d-dimer um, and when it's elevated we know that the person's coagulation system has been turned on that a clot has been made, and when the clot's broken down, it, when it's enzymatically clipped into pieces, one of those pieces is called the D-dimer. And it's stoichiometrically um, related to the amount of clot burden or the amount of clot that's there. And so when you have an elevated D-dimer, we know two things had to have happened. One is that your coagulation system is turned on and that you've made a clot. Because you cannot make a dimer without actually making a clot first. And so concizumab and fetuzuran patients have high dimers. And so they're not bleeding, they're not having overt thrombosis, but they're running around with the, with the fragments of a broken down clot. And so um, that's scary to people. And we don't quite know why. Or where, or, or how much, yeah. Like where, where is that being generated? Is that all at your endothelial surface and it's just a slow turnover of whatever is dysregulated at the, where that molecule is? Are you making little clots and then breaking them down? I don't know. Is there any reason to think that that's or could be connected to any of the thrombotic adverse events that have occurred? Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks so. Like if you look at the dose of factor eight or factor nine that you get if you're on the Tuzeran, it's tiny. Right, I think your I think your 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 correction for factor eight is 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 um is thirty percent for a major bleed, or, or less than that. Maybe it's ten units per kilo, if you have a major bleed and you're on fetuzuran. So that's going to be the big trick for, for for people at HTCs if people go on to that drug, for instance. And we don't yeah. know what the what the equivalent is for concizumab. Is that when a person calls you and says I'm bleeding, they may not have bled in a few years. And so they're probably calling you because they want to know just, you know, I don't quite remember what you told me two years ago about this, but I know there's something different. Well, if the dude on the other side of the phone doesn't know what's different, 
they're going to tell them to take a, take a normal dose. Right, 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 right. Right, and so, we, so you have to ensure on the front end, right, that the patient at home has no other dose but the small dose. But let's say they forget their dose, they go to an ER. I mean, all those stupid things are going to are gonna hop out. I mean, the education around treating bleeding is going to be giant for all of these products. And this protein C inhibitor that's being worked on at Penn, same thing. You know, we, we're not certain how, how unbraked your coagulation system is because you're inhibiting it so much that if you goose it just a little bit, uh, you know, how much do you have to step on the gas? That's really tricky to know. I mean, you learn that in Pertuzeran because a person got a clot, but you also, they, but they also knew this because you know, they could spike it in in vitro. So I think that probably going forward, they're gonna be, there's gonna be a lot more modeling, let's say, of coagulation, and there's gonna be better guesses as to safe dosing, initial dosing, but, um, I think that's going to be, uh, you know, a big difference. And of course, that just drops factor consumption if you're thinking economically right down. Right. right. I mean, if everyone gets on emicizumab, fetuzeran, I mean, you, you could say that every factor eight and factor nine patient in the United States doesn't need to be infusing factors prophylaxis. Only if they were all on one of those. Right. And we yeah. know how much people infuse on emicizumab, frighteningly little. And so the whole factor market, which supports the world, right? The U.S. factor price pricing market supports world pricing hmm. will collapse. I guess in, in kind of summarizing what we've been talking about, what will you be looking for, you know, most? Or what are the top two, three things you're going to be looking for, assuming that there's an approval in 18 days and we're going to face these things in reality? What are you going to be keeping an eye on and talking to colleagues about? I think one is um, patient selection and then HTC readiness probably are the two things. I think like as a region, we have to decide who we're going to recommend gene therapy to initially um, and where we think it should be done and kind of the minimum requirements. You know, payers have floated the idea that they want to certify either centers or physicians or teams to be able to take care of these patients because they feel like it's their investment. It's not only the investment of the patient's life, you know, of course mm -hmm. it is, but they want kind of, to kind of double down on that. You know, they're not going to uh, believe that, you know, your, your ethical obligation to the care of the patient is enough. They want to certify that you know what you're doing, that you, you know, have, have at least been educated or experienced or whatever, something that reassures them that when when they when their when their when their patient gets that that they're in good hands and, and i do have a sense that that might come down that there's going to be a certification process that would make sense that makes sense mm -hmm. wow well thank you for for this time this has been no such a, a uh a lot to think about a lot of i mean frankly cause for concern but that's okay. Sometimes there's cause for concern and <laughs> just got to keep paying attention as things shift and change. And yeah. uh, man, individualized medicine feels like it, but the more and more that we, I guess, learn about the science and the more that treatments teach us about the human mm -hmm. response to various manipulations, um, right. it really does make the case for the need for individualized medicine. The whole financial business component is something else, but right. wow, what a time to be alive. No, it's great. With hemophilia. No. no, it is. No, I I think that the choices are are, are tremendous, right? And and, yes. and 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 I think that uh, m many of them will have led and will lead patients to healthier and better lives, regardless. Uh, I mean, you know, a consequence for a number of our patients on gene therapy is that they're healthier. Right. <laughs> I mean, they are just healthier. They don't drink. They exercise. You know, they talk. Mm. You know, they talk to themselves or their spouses more. Um, they see themselves as better fathers. One guy's like, "I'm a better dad." He said, "I'm just a better person." I'm not. He says, "I am. I am fundamentally a better person." Wow. And I'm a person that I I wouldn't have thought that I, you know, I I couldn't have predicted this as an outcome of this, right? Wow. Uh, Right, it's like a person who stops doing cocaine. Right, right. They're not, <laughs> they're not a bad person underneath all of that. Right, 
right. But 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 they don't they don't know it. They don't see it. They don't allow other people to experience it in that way. And then when it hits them, like oh, this is the potential, right? Now I can have a purpose and I can execute that purpose. Yes, uh, it's pretty powerful. Doctor Mike, what do you attribute that to? I mean. Obviously, they they have to stop drinking during the trial and those types of things. But the weight of thinking about infusions or the um, chronic pain issues does that play into it? What plays into that mental health shift? Yeah, you know, I don't know. You know, Glenn talks about this a lot after his his liver transplant. Um, I I think one big part is that. Um, for the first time, many people, um, I mean, Mark Skinner always talks about this idea that hemophilia patients are, are preconditioned to what they can and cannot do by the time they're an adult. Mm. They have a very fixed mindset about what they're capable and incapable of doing. And both of those things actually limit them because they don't, execute what they're fully capable of doing and they might be overestimating what they're incapable of doing mm -hmm. and i think what happens is that over time people one they get over this relief they they, they lose fear right like mm -hmm. glenn always told me he couldn't believe for three four five six months that he wouldn't bleed in the morning that he wouldn't wake up and not have a bleed he said he just didn't believe it he'd wake up every morning and think is, you know, is today the day that I'm going to wake up with a knee bleed? And it just never happened. But as he, said, he said it took him months to actually believe that, that that was real. And he said once he believed that was real, he didn't have the fear of that anymore. And then once he didn't have that, he wasn't carrying around that. He said he started to broaden what he felt his life could be. Um, and so maybe there are lots of little pieces in there. Well, thanks again for the time, Dr. Mike. Uh, of course. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Thank you, Dr. Kwan, Dr. Young, Dr. Valentino. And thank you to Spark for making the science fair possible. Uh, the science fair this year, of course, like everything, a, f a fully virtual experience uh, meant that we adapted it in our, our platform that we're very proud of. Um, to an online experience. So if you go to thesciencefair.org, you can take yourself through, well, Dr. Morales will guide you through the science fair, my favorite animated physician. No <laughs> offense to other animated physicians who may be listening. <laughs> so thesciencefair.org and a big shout out to Spark for making that possible. And um, just before we go, another podcast that people might be interested in if you have stuck around to listen to the end of today's episode is something that Amy has been working on. You've heard us talk about it before, but I think given today's news, Amy, it's maybe more relevant now than it has been thus far. Absolutely. It's in the genes, a gene therapy podcast. Episode three uh, is out this week. It's all about clinical trials. And we have a research nurse working in a gene therapy center at Boston Children's um, taking us through what the clinical trial process is like. And um, it's it, it's just really good stuff. Again, expectation management. <laughs> when we're going through this, I mean, it's it's it, it is a massive you know, undertaking. And for those of us um, kind of thinking about if we want to do this in the future, it might not be a clinical trial process, but um, the actual product is going to be a lot. It's not going to be one and done. Um, there's going to yeah. be a lot of data collection. And so just to have that in mind of what that's going to be. So check it out. It's great. Um, and she's really wonderful. Is. Yes. Colleen Dancero um, from Boston Children's is our guest. And as I say in the beginning, everything should be explained by a nurse, like not just <laughs> clinical things, like everything should be explained by a nurse. So it's a great episode. I highly recommend. So maybe what we really needed is for Clarissa to become a nurse. No. O-M-G. Was that just... <laughs> Should I have left that one on the cutting room floor before I even opened my mouth? 100%. If people have stuck around this long, I hope that they like. <laughs> they, you, you should appreciate a good Clarissa Explains It All reference. And if you don't, I don't need you listening anymore. It's okay. Anyway, no. it might, that, that might have aged us, but it's cool. It's cool. I feel fine. I feel uh, fine. Look, the, the silver streaking through my hair has started that process years ago. So Clarissa Explains It All <laughs> ain't got nothing on the age of this fella. 
But with that, we have uh, certainly used up our time and energy. So we will say um, farewell for now. Check out It's in the Jeans. As Amy said at the top of the show, if you do want to share with us your thoughts, your feelings, your expectations, your hopes, dreams, fears as it relates to gene therapy or really anything to do with being a member of the Bleeding Disorders community, reach out to Amy Board, reach out to Patrick James Lynch, reach out to info or mailbag, rather mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. You can find Bloodstream Media on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. You can find Amy Board or Patrick James Lynch on any one of those places as well. If you're not a subscriber to Bloodstream, oh, come on, you're still here. You may as well be a subscriber. If you like Clarissa <laughs> jokes, you stuck around. Be a subscriber. Um, and share the show with others. Tell others that's the best way that Bloodstream and what we provide here can reach other members of our community. We'll be back next week with our next episode. And until then, my name is Patrick James Lynch. Take care, everybody. My name's Amy Board. Take self-care of yourself, indeed. Bye, everybody. Bye.